lovely to be with you this morning. It's a long time since I've been here. Van has just informed me this morning he's here almost 10 years and that came to me as something of a shock but uh, when you get to the like of my age time seems to drift away so very very quickly. I can hardly believe it's over 10 years now since I've been here although he does inform me that I was here during his tenure or so uh, but again, my memory doesn't serve me too well. Anyway, but it's lovely to be here. Well, let's pray together. Our gracious God, you have gathered us together this morning for the express purpose to offer worship, to offer worship to the God that you are, the God who has revealed himself as the creator of God, the provider of every good and perfect gift, but above it all, the Redeemer God, the purpose for which you have made the world and all things consist by that name by which sinners are redeemed. We come to offer you our praise that you humble yourself even to look upon the wonder and complexity and majesty of all that you've made. And yet, wonder of wonders, the God that you are, a God who is infinite, eternal, unchangeable, the glorious one, the one whom the highest form of angels can't even look upon, that you've condescended and you've entered your own world, and you did so for the express purpose of saving men and women from the righteous judgment that you will exercise. Father, hear us as we come to worship that you will accept of our thanks for your grace, this grace that leaves those of us who have received it breathless. Wonder of all wonders that you should condescend to become us and to enter this world to take the form of a servant to be made in the likeness of men. 
to die the death of the cross. That sinners, men and women, such as gathered here this morning, each of us, that you, could, you should create for yourself a ground upon which you can receive such and receive them eternally. So hear us as we come to worship. We ask that you will grant to us that liberty, that help, that understanding, that concentration upon holy things. For truly we do know that there's so much that demands our attention, much that is legitimate in its place, and yet nothing is more important than this, then we should know God. Hear us as we pray that you will grant us that your gracious spirit will do that work, opening the eyes of the blind, enabling men and women to hear, removing unbelief, and granting that true faith. Faith in Jesus Christ, the trust in him is this life eternal. So be with us now, we pray, for we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, if you would take your Bible and turn to begin with to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. I'm going to begin reading verse 25. It will be for most of you familiar, but maybe not all of you. These are the text in particular referred to as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Verse 25 then of Luke chapter 10. Let's now hear the very voice of God. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you shall live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed and left him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. May God grant us understanding of his word for Jesus' sake. Once again, take your hymn book and this time turn to 106. 106. Read him by the writer William Gadsby. Immortal honours. Rest on Jesus' head, my God, my portion, my living bread. In him I live, upon him cast my care. He saves from death, destruction, and despair. 106, we're going to stand 
and worship as we sing these words. Once again, take your Bible and turn now to Paul's letter to the Philippians and to to chapter 3. Now, the text that I've read to you already and the hymns that we've sung. And this text may not seem to you to be terribly fitting for harvest, but I hope by the time I finish this morning, you will see that there is a profound connection between harvest as we understand it generally and harvest as we must understand it eternally and to understand the purpose for which the world was made the purpose for which you were created, the purpose for which I was created, it is all spoken of here in this passage of Philippians chapter 3 in particular. Beginning to read then from verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for evil, the evil workers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, 
a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and to count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I, that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Once again, may God bless to our understanding his word for Jesus' sake. Well, let's pray together. Lord, we, we thank you for the Bible. We praise you that it is your self-revelation. You have made yourself known throughout its pages as the creator, as the great redeemer of sinners. We rejoice to know that you're the God that you are, the God who is beyond the reach of our, our native minds. No matter how brilliant a mind may be, we can never stumble across you or find you out by seeking. But you are the God who reveals yourself, the God who has made himself known, the God by whom we have access into your very presence, the God who promises acceptance when such access is granted to us, that by faith obtaining this access, we are assured of acceptance. And acceptance enables us to the enjoyment of this adoption, this family of God to which you bring those who believe in Jesus. To our Father, this day we pray that you will grant again that you will do that which is needful and bring to an understanding men and women who as yet, maybe even in these opening moments, do not understand the purpose for their very being, but that each of us might understand this. Those of us who know you, that we might know you better, that we might realize the wondrous grace and privilege that it is to be known of God and to know God. Remember us, Lord, as we come from our separate situations. We're all distinct. In your creating brilliance, you have made us, made us all so very different. And we face different sets of circumstances. We, we have come from a week that has gone by and we have all had different experiences and yet we have this one thing in common. You have made us for yourself. And yet, Nate, if we live for ourselves, we rob you. We deny you your sovereign right, your prerogative, is ownership of us. 
that we might enjoy you and enjoy the wonder of your grace forever. So be with us now, we pray, and as we think of the, the church here in Crumlin, we think of the community round about, we do ask, gracious God, that many might be awakened to the wonder of your goodness and your loving kindness, your mercy, and awakened to the great fact that there is a great day of judgment, that this gracious God will bring men and women into judgment, and for this purpose you sent your Son into the world to seek and to save that which was lost, to bring men and women into your very nearer presence, that they might worship, that they might own you as God, as Lord, as King of all, as the one whose majesty outstrips the majesties of your own wondrous creation and all the majesty and pomp of men but you rule in the affairs of men. You do what you please. This is your right. Hear us as we offer ourselves now to you. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, once again, if you would take your head book and turn this time to 562. Five, sorry, yes, that's 562. <coughs> Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount, it, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Again we'll stand as we sing these words together. be helpful for you and for me if you would take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3 that I've read to you. A few months back I was sitting outside Whitehead Baptist Church waiting for the service and I was listening to Lady Ulster and to the morning service of Lady Ulster. Sometimes it's good, 
Sometimes it's not so good. Other times it's really bad. That morning, I would say, well, it was all right. It's such that I heard of it. A young lady came forward to sing. She sang a song that I'd never heard before, haven't heard since. But I was kind of captivated by a phrase that was in the song. I can't sing, so I'm not even going to attempt to sing it for you. But it was like this. You're God, and I am not. That really did rock me, because it doesn't sound terribly profound, does it? And yet it is. It goes beyond all telling. You're God, and I am not. One famous theologian from the past once put it like this. We can never worship God as we should until we know him as he is. We have to concur with that because that's the theme of the whole Bible, isn't it? That's the whole theme of the Bible. And while our great theme today is harvest, the theme of the Bible transcends all that we can understand of the physical or natural world. The great transcendent truth is this, that God has made all things, created all things, and created all things for his pleasure. The high point of his creation on the sixth day was the creation of humankind. It seems a strange thing that a Baptist should be before you this morning and quote one of your great old standards, which of course I can wholeheartedly concur with. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's the purpose for which we are here. We thank God for the native creation. We thank God for the benefits we have of food and clothing and all those other benefits that just can't be numbered. Benefits that often pass by our notice. But yet this great theme of the Bible is that each of us should know God. And we can know something of God, can't we, through the natural creation. For example, Psalm 19 is very graphic. It can't be misunderstood. Day after day, night after night, shows forth knowledge. And the wondrous truth is that the creation itself is a very eloquent testimony, isn't it, to God's creating brilliance. He has made all things. Man hasn't yet discovered all things. I read an article just very recently of some great depths of the Atlantic Ocean which have yet to be plummeted. And they have discovered a fish that they never knew existed. Existing, but it's always been there, hasn't it, from the beginning of time, one form or another. It's a wondrous thing, the creation. And it is there to be admired. And God has set it forth that every language should understand something, something of the Creator. It just didn't come into being. It's not the net product of some indeterminable time and some thing happening that everything suddenly came into being. It's the result of creating brilliance over the period of six days. But what is it all about? And we do live in a world of great confusion. And the confusion is deepening as it would seem day by day. The confusion is such as leaves some of us, can I suggest, reasonable thinking people. It leaves us staggered. Can it actually be so? I read an article just a little while back of something that I'd never heard of before. It may be you've heard of it. It's referred to as sologamy. Could you indicate to me, put your hand up if you've ever heard of sologamy. S-O-L-O-G-A-M-Y. Sologamy. Why? No, I don't see any hands going up. 
Well, let me tell you what sologamy is. I'll show you just how intelligent I am. Sologamy. Well, it's self-marriage. That's a good one, isn't it? Self-marriage. That does kind of epitomise, doesn't it, the confusion of the world in which you and I live in. You cannot officially marry yourself. That's a staggering thing, isn't it? But when I read the article, the little last section of it, it just left me breathless. Do you know the main, the main theme or the main, uh, uh, what we say, covenant vow that is made whenever you marry yourself? Now, you can have a wedding, you can have a reception, you can even have an attendant there to officiate at it. But you make a promise. You make a promise, and the promise is this. You always promise to be there for yourself. You promise to be there for yourself. Well, narcissism is alive and well, isn't it? It's a, it's a godless world. You see, the world doesn't want to know about God. It's not at all, to any degree, interested natively in God at all. The natural man fabricates from self an image of God that suits himself, a God with whom he can live conveniently, a God with whom he can live comfortably. But the Bible presents us with a different picture, doesn't it? The Bible presents us with God. And one Puritan once put it like this, the most awkward, difficult thought that the natural man can ever have is the thought of God is revealed in the Bible. And that's true, isn't it? Naturally, we recoil from this. For the very impulse to pursue God originates with God. We don't stumble across him. He's not found out in the way that scientists find out things and discover things. God is self-revealing. Paul deals with that, and Peter deals with it in his own inimitable style. And he does so in particular in Philippians chapter 3, presenting to us this, this fundamental truth, this unassailable truth <coughs> that God has made us and made us for the purpose of worship. He begins, of course, rather strangely, you might say. He begins with a warning. Beware of dogs. That's not the kind that some of us have become fond of, the kind that bark and so on. But people who are ravenous, he refers to them in a secondary sense as evil workers. Because the Apostle Paul has in mind, he has as his objective here, God's supreme objective. And before he will get to this, he will warn of people who will come with perverse notions, strange ideas, godless philosophies. So issues this great warning to beware. Beware of what you listen to. Beware of whom you listen to. Beware of what you read. And we're living in a world of, of, of great communicative brilliance. And communication has become the order of the day. And we are shaped by this, aren't we? We are shaped by it. We are formed by it. And we have to be so, so careful. It's essential that we listen to the right voice. And the true voice, the only voice that we can truly listen to and trust is the voice of God himself. And the Apostle Paul has this great objective in mind. But he's going to take us in something of a journey before he gets there. But he's going to do this carefully. He's going to do it systematically. He's going to do it that we can make no mistake at the end of it all as to why we are here. For what purpose do I exist? What is it really all about? 
because in the world in which you and I live, this has become so tragically unfashionable. I read just recently something of the statistics of suicide, a terrible thing. And just recently, well, some time back, some months ago, one young man up in the Korean area took his life. And before he took his life, he phoned his mother. And you could hardly imagine. But his final words were these. Life is not worth living. I have nothing to live for. 16-year-old. 16-year-old. Nothing to live for. My, my. What a world we live in. What a society we have bred. The Apostle Paul has here for us, if you care to listen to this this morning, and care to take this to heart, this great truth, that will guide us and guard us and govern us that at last we might realize the purpose for which God has made us. Well, as I say, God has granted the Apostle Paul this great gift and he has written these words for us. And he begins, I said, at a distance. He begins with himself. He begins by presenting himself to us as he was prior to his conversion of which we read, of course, in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, here's a man who has got murderous intentions. Uh, Nothing could distract him or dissuade him from his his great love of his, his native Judaism. He lived for it. And I should say this by way of a side, because the Apostle Paul refers to himself as a Pharisee, and sometimes, and rightly so, to a great extent, we have... We have seen there's a great parallel between Phariseeism and hypocrisy. They have become synonymous. We, 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 we even use the term, don't we? Well, that's kind of Pharisaic. But not all the Pharisees were, were fully paid up hypocrites. They largely were. At times in Matthew 23, our Lord utters those great words, Woe or cursed are you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. But whatever else you say about Saul of Tarsus, he he was not a hypocrite. He was sincere, but sincerely wrong. And yet, God meets him on God's terms on the road to Damascus. And it's all changed for him. Here's a man who had violence at heart to destroy the name and the church of Jesus Christ. And as I say, nothing would distract him, nothing would dissuade him from this great purpose. But Jesus stops him. And this this great contact, this conversation that takes place, and Saul of Tarsus has changed. And he speaks of this change, doesn't he? And he makes his boast here, doesn't he? Seven references he makes to his former trust in himself, his ritual circumcision, the rite appointed by God, even through the ancient prophets, his relationship to Israel, his respectability as from the the tribe of Benjamin. He's racially identified the Hebrews, four of these great portions of his testimony are inherited. Three are personal achievements, first of which, he's a religious Pharisee. He's focused. He's got one intention, and that is to advance his religion. His reputation as being a zealot for this religion and his righteousness as pertaining to the law of God as Saul of Tarsus formally understood it, which, of course, was perverse, presents us, first of all, with his pedigree and what a pedigree it actually is. He was some guy, wasn't he? 
some man. Religious, you might say to the eye teeth. No one could point a finger. This man was incredibly religious. Secular history tells us something of Saul of Tarsus, that he's considered as being the supreme authority of his day, in his day, the great Jew of Jews. Staggering thing, isn't it? How, how people get so focused in on themselves. Here's a man who was beset round about with all the trappings of first century Jewish traditions. Somewhere in the region of 613 extra biblical laws referred to as the Mishnah, added over centuries of time to protect the law of God, so much so that the very law of God is given by Moses in Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and then worked out throughout the rest of the Bible. That law is it's lost. It's immersed in mad-made tradition. You've heard it said, of course, Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. And then he says in another place, you've made the, the word of God vain through, or sorry, you've made it void through your vain traditions. He had religion. He had it in bucket pools, we might say. And yet, we make this amazing discovery that when we come face to face with this character, Saul of Tarsus, or Paul as he became, and as he presents his case here, we discover that there is something that he becomes so eternally passionate about. He puts it like this, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. All that religion, all the confidence that he could ever say he had in it, where he's able to dot the I's, cross the T's, strict in his observance of it. He unceremoniously ditches it all, casts it all off. Now that's a staggering thing, isn't it? This was this man's occupation. And he did well through it. He would have been well paid well thought of, highly respected, dignified and honourable as he would go about, looked upon as a great authority among the Pharisees. Yet he says, all of this, I count as worthless. Actually, in the authorised version that I commonly would read from, it has it as rubbish has not it? Or as your NIV has it, should I say, rubbish. But it hasn't the authorised version done. And I kind of like to put it like this. How does Paul view his former life? Well, it's something like this. Something like this. You're walking along the street and you step on something that some dog has left and the owner of the dog has failed to lift it. You step in it. And you'll only hope that before you get home to your nice, nice clean home and walk this stuff in, you would think to clean it off your shoe. And that's what the image is presented here, isn't it? He's cleaning this stuff off his shoe. That's how he views his former religion. And rightly so, in comparison to the wondrous worth that he had gained in being brought face to face and to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this other stuff's obliterated, and he counts it as rubbish, dung, that I may win Christ. What was it? What was it he came to understand in those moments on the road to Damascus? We were not given terribly graphic detail by looking in the Acts of the Apostles, but the change is so profound in 
in Saul of Tarsus that you don't even get to the end of the chapter that his, his friends, his contemporaries, his fellow Pharisees and all the relig religious establishment uh, have lost their champion and the, the only one thing that they can possibly do because he who was the, the great advocate of Judaism now becomes the great advocate of Christianity and the great adversary of that kind of perverse Judaism that was present then. But what was it? What was it that so captivated him, so captured his great imagination? And it was this, that the eternal God condescended and came into this world, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he writes about this, doesn't he, in the second chapter. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, the God that Saul of Tarsus formerly worshipped was a God of human imagination and the God that he is now face to face with on the road to Damascus is the great creator God, the one who is king, the sovereign who rules the affairs of men, who sets up kingdoms, who pulls down kingdoms, who made us, made us, as I say, for himself. And we'll arrive there just in a moment. But let me ask you this question. What does the death and the cross of Jesus Christ mean to you? Is there any resemblance in what we read here? Can you honestly say that you have come face to face with this monumental truth? This truth that eclipses everything else. This truth that this God became us. That the child in the womb of Mary was God. The embryo that developed was God. The child that was born was God. The adolescent was God. The man God. Is, is this what you, you understand? That this, this one who became us he entered this world and he did so for the express purpose of dying that death of the cross. And he did so in order to create for God himself a basis upon which God can remain just and yet be the justifier of them that believe in Jesus. This is just God, this, this one who is the pure spirit who cannot tolerate, look upon, or have sin in his presence of any shape or kind. This God who is a consuming fire, who is light unapproachable. We refer to this as holiness, of which we can, with our human minds, have no true concept. Because this God is the transcendent God, beyond our reach. And he went to the cross. Jesus, the eternal son, goes to the cross. What, what, what do you understand of it? Can you begin to conceive that this was done for you? That he died for you? Can you think for a moment, just outside the box a little bit, outside yourself, and let's think for a moment, you stand before God. What will you offer? You may be like the Apostle Paul <clears throat> and have a sevenfold testimony. But what about Jesus? Because you see, the currency of heaven is not human merit works of any kind. It's not being deeply religious. Saul of Tarsus was that. But he needed what each of us need. A new birth. A, a new life. The old life. 
and all the judgment due to it removed, eradicated, removed forever. Do you understand that in the cross of Jesus Christ, God was exercising justice, judgment. That's what it was. Uh, and isn't the case so very, very often that when we, we think of the cross, we, we think in purely physical terms, and I'm not in any sense speaking down about the physical sufferings of Jesus because the prophet tells us that he suffered more than that of any man. But all that we see is the physical suffering, and if that's all you see, you've missed the point, haven't you? Because behind all the horror and the evil, the evil perpetrated on that day by evil men with evil hands in the killing of the actual physical frame of Jesus, behind all of that, there's the hand of God. There's justice. And justice is executed. In the death of Jesus, God is exercising judgment. Jesus is voluntarily taking to himself, he's assuming to himself, my sin and your sin, if but you be a Christian. And will take your sin if you're not yet a Christian, if you're willing to abandon yourself with all the kind of claim that you may have. Ditch it because it's worthless. It will drag you down to hell and keep you there from which you will never, ever escape. Never. The cross of Jesus Christ is the meeting point of sinners and God. There's none other. None. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Or to put in apostolic language, there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. All the religions of this world, they're all estranged from this. Here is the unique way of salvation for one who will believe. The glory is this, that this Jesus died and rose again the third day. The final seal of heaven as to the sufficiency of the death of Jesus to cover all the sin of all sinners from the beginning of time to the end of time who would ever believe upon the name of Jesus. It's an accomplished thing. It's done. You see, all the religions of this world, differ as they do in many, many ways, have this one thing in common. They're all basically human work-based. It's what you do. It's all about doing, doing, doing. Christianity, done. Done, it's finished. It's work that has been completed. And the resurrection of Jesus is the seal of heaven. God has raised his son. But then you say, well, that's interesting. That's also very interesting. That is that, isn't it? But have you ever stopped to think about it in the poor terms that I presented it to you here this morning? That you have a responsibility because God made you for himself. And you see, the truth is, if there was no one else in the world, he would still die for you. This is the truth we know, isn't it? You matter. You matter so much he gave his son to die for you. What do you want to do with it? Are you want to pass it off, maybe as you've done many, many times in the past, walk out the door. But I would plead with you this morning to stop and consider this because you will stand before God. You will. Of that, there is not a shadow of doubt. What will be your response? There's one door and only one, just one. Jesus Christ is that door. When he died upon the cross, he was raised again for the justification of those that believe in Jesus, that they should have new life and that they should have life that is abundant and full and glorious as God intends it to be. For the end of it all, the end product, creation, providence, redemption, 
the end of the story is this, that sinners should be brought to know God. It's a staggering thing that so very, very often, even within Christian circles, within the Christian church, we have, we have lost this. We have lost it some way or another. Over the midst of time, and even in the name of orthodoxy, we can do this. What is the chief purpose? Well, someone will say, it's a great commission. But the great commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, isn't it? Gospel is what? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To save them for what end? To save them from their sin that they may know God. That's it. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's it. And that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? That's it. Well concentrated for you. The apostle has this in view that I may know him. The great priority. He presents his pedigree, the truth of which he was persuaded, and presents the great priority, that I may know him, that I may know him. That's it. Well, who do you know? Well, some of us can boast we know this or that, or this person or that person. But do you know God? Do you know Jesus Christ? For he is the one who has made God in the fullest sense known. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And all the glory and all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him. Is this what the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2? In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And those who believe are complete in him. Complete. Complete. Coming to a realization for your very existence. Not to advance your own cause, but to be advanced in your knowledge of God and all that that involves and the romance of it all, the wonder of it all. Let this God lead you and guide you and guard you. And does this simply because it's his pleasure to do so. Well, let me draw this all to something of a conclusion this morning. What is the whole sense, this purpose, this priority of knowing God? Well, if I can put it for you as succinctly as I can. In the Old Testament, it was represented very graphically for us. First, in the tabernacle, that is the traveling tent for the people of Israel. And then in the temple, this permanent structure in Jerusalem. And God had assigned every detail of the tabernacle and the temple, all that it should, it, should, it should contain, every detail of it. And when Moses was directed with the tabernacle, he was told again and again to make, make it according to the pattern, everything to the final detail. And when it came to the final details, three compartments, and to the final two compartments, that is the most holy place and the holy place. In the holy place, the, the high priest would enter there and then go into the holy place once a year with the blood of a lamb, telling of that which would become, become thousands of years later. And as he would go into the holy place, he'd be reminded of the purpose of all of this with three implements that were to be fixed in the holy place. And you can take them in whatever order you like, it matters not. The first we can say is the table of showbread. The table of showbread. What was the message of the table of showbread? What was conveyed to the high priest as he would go to perform this, this last rite in order that Israel might be forgiven of sin. What was this? Fellowship. Fellowship through the blood that would be offered upon the mercy seat and the altar. Fellowship 
is the end that God has, it, has in view. Now, I'm told that some good people have invited me for lunch today. I don't know what I will eat. But there will be in the plate where I can sit and look at it and admire it. And we do that, don't we? In the modern culinary world, you can be given a plate this size with something this size on it, and you think, well, that doesn't seem very worthwhile to me. But what about we do with eating it? Well, it may not be the word that you think of, but whatever it is I'm given to eat today, I will have fellowship with it. It will become part of me. The table of showbread. What about the altar of incense? What was the message of the altar of incense? Well, it surprised you. Fellowship. Fellowship. Just the same. Fellowship. I have a childhood memory of my father and mother's bedroom. Certainly more of my own, but my father and mother's bedroom. And I don't know how I ever discovered it, but whether my mother had asked me to bring her a cardigan. But at the top drawer of this tall boy thing, she had her cardigans. And I remember as a little child, and my memory's fading of so much, but I can remember this little small bottle about this size, a kind of a, a purpley colored bottle with no top on it. I thought, one remember thinking at the time, well, what's that there for? It's empty. What was it there for? Well, I never asked my mother. But I surmise that the purpose for being there was to extract the last vestiges of the perfume on her cardigan. I can only imagine that. Probably right. What does a woman do? Or, as many times, more often than not, maybe men are more into the cosmetic world than women are that. What do you do when you put perfume on? Well, you have fellowship with it, don't you? You attach it to yourself. Fellowship. What about the golden candlestick? Well, we gather this evening, at least partway through the service this evening, we would need lights. What was the message of the golden candlestick? Fellowship. Fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. It's all about this, that God would have fellowship. Why was man made? Why did God create Adam and Eve? Fellowship. Let us make man in our image. This great focus from the beginning of the Bible is carried out, and the whole purpose of God is ratified because sin has entered into, into the world. And we see a world ruined, but God will put right that which man put wrong. And the only way he can do this is not by establishing a religious system of complexity, presenting difficulties for men and women to come to some point of achievement, but he had to come himself. He had to come himself. The one who made the world became us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He made all things, and he makes himself. and takes the very form of human beings. I read to you this morning from Luke chapter 10. And with this I finish this morning. I hope something that has been said will impact upon you. Because you see, even as Christians, we can get ourselves lost in busyness as Christians. We can. In the midst of the great need for evangelism, we can get lost. Now, I read to you from Luke chapter 10, 
closing section in particular, where our Lord goes to the home of Mary and Martha. And of course, the whole picture there is so graphically painted for us, isn't it? Here is Martha. Martha, she's busying herself with much and it's off times away in churches, isn't it? We can be so busy that we just can't see the wood for the trees. We don't understand certain things. We lose focus. And there's much to occupy our minds. But Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet. And someone say, well, there's a balance in it. Well, there is, but let me stick to the text. Let me stick to the text. What does the text say? Well, the text says that Martha became somewhat irritated. And it's often, often the case in churches that uh, a couple of people do just about everything and the rank and file, the rest, well, it just happens for them. But we'll not go into that too deeply. But she becomes irritated. She's busying herself with a great deal of stuff. Stuff that was right in, in its place. But she complains that Mary's not doing anything. I leave you with the words of Jesus. Martha, Martha, thou art cumbered about many things. Mary has chosen the better part. The better part. You see, my focus, your focus as a Christian, if but you be a true Christian, is to know God and any usefulness that you might ever have will be fixed on that and on that alone just that to know God to know God you only come to know God through Jesus Christ because he has come to make the Father known by him we obtain life by him we obtain heavenly citizenship with all that heaven promises and by him we escape the eternal abyss of hell with the horrors that are enumerated for us in the bible that i may know him and the power of his resurrection the fellowship of his sufferings being made, being made conformable Onto his death. Harvest. It's all about that. In the final analysis, when all is said that can be said, there's a final day when God will send forth angels to reap from the four corners of the earth, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. And there will be that great day when God will judge every person, every person. How will it be for you in that day when you stand before God? Can you name the name of Jesus? Will you, even now, ditch all those hopes that you might have in yourself, those things that you imagine, somewhere or another, God will be obliged to accept? No, he won't. No, he can't. No, he will not. God is God, and you are not. God is God, and I am not. Well, we'll, we'll sing together as we close this morning. we we'll sing together in the words of number 200. Number 200. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember? Who can cease to sing his praise? He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. We'll stand as we sing together.
Thank you, Tom, for, for bringing God's word to us uh, this morning. I look forward to our service this evening at six o'clock. But as we close this service, uh, remain standing, please, and receive these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.